go through chapter 12 tonight. We won't get through too many verses, but the last time we were together, uh, you'll remember in the round pen, we, we, we were in the first couple of verses, and so tonight uh, we're going to gain some more insight into uh, these subject of spiritual gifts and the misuse of supposed spiritual gifts. And I phrased that exactly how I wanted to phrase it. The misuse of supposed spiritual gifts. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. You, you may remember in our discussion last time we was together that the number one problem here in this Corinthian church was the cultural influence on the church. And really, that's a reverse of what the design of the church should be. The church should be influencing the culture, amen or not. Not the culture influencing the church. We should infiltrate the culture. The culture shouldn't infiltrate the church. Well, that's not what was going on here at Corinth. At Corinth. And by the way, Paul himself planted this church. Paul was the first pastor of this church. And it's really, really in a, a state of disarray. There's really some bizarre things going on in this church as far as worship goes and their understanding, uh, their ignorance of spiritual gifts. And sadly, there's, there's a lot of things that go on today in a lot of churches that is described as the work of the Holy Spirit that cannot at all be contributed to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be looking at some of those things as we move forward. So the cultural influence, which was just really paganism, because cultural, or Corinth was a mecca for, for paganism. And so the influence that uh, this pagan culture had on this church showed up in its worship. Now, why would some of these very bizarre practices uh, from the culture find its way into the church? Well, it was for the sake of being spiritual. Their desire was to be spiritual. But you can't be spiritual outside of the truth of God's Word and the influence of the Holy Spirit, amen or not. There's just no way to be spiritual apart from that. Uh, if you go outside of the work of the Holy Spirit and outside of the Word of God, then you wind up with situations just like Corinth did. You, 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 you bring other experiences in, other cultural uh, impacts in, and that's what's going on here. So Paul sets them straight. Uh, he literally, in, in verse 1, if, if, if you're there with me, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Some translations may possibly say ignorant. Paul's setting the tone. Uh, he's setting the stage for moving forward, and he's letting, letting us know as he writes this letter. And by the way, this letter is a response to a letter that has been written to him. If you remember, way back in chapter 7, we find out that the Corinthians had written to Paul and asked Paul some questions. This is more response to those questions that they got. And so as we move forward and we start addressing some issues we need to understand that what Paul is doing, he is addressing their ignorance of spiritual gifts. He is addressing their unawareness of spiritual gifts. And so that's what we need to keep in mind because that helps us keep everything lined up and everything in context. And the reason that I stress that is because many people who still are using or let me just put it like this, many people who are uh, participating and carrying out some still bizarre practices in the church today attribute it to the Holy Spirit. And Paul is setting the stage for us all to be informed of what the Holy Spirit does and what's not of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of tests that we'll see that you can apply to certain situations to find out if that is of the Holy Spirit or if it's not of the Holy Spirit. Are y'all all right? Okay. So that's what's going on. Uh, 
He says, concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be unaware. I do not want you to be ignorant. So he's answering the questions. Obviously, someone has written to him from this church because they see what's going on in this church, and they have some questions about some of the things that's going on. So the Apostle Paul is just simply correcting the Corinthian believers uh, on what is given by the Holy Spirit and what's not given by the Holy Spirit. In verse 2, he reminds them how they themselves used to be led away uh, to uh, pagan idol worship. And uh, remember, as we closed out the Bible study last Wednesday night, we closed it out by asking this question. How bad was it at Corinth? How bizarre was some of the things going on inside of this church? Well, in verse 3, we see how, how far south, let's just say it like that, how far south these Corinthian believers had went in their practice of worship. Verse 3 of chapter 12, Paul says, Therefore, I make known to you. Now, remember the word therefore. You need to back up and see what therefore is there for. It's because he's addressing their ignorance and unawareness of spiritual gifts. In verse 3, he says, Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So he gives two dynamics there. One thing is a positive, one thing is a negative. No one can say, this is the first one, this is the negative, Jesus is accursed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit will never lead a believer to say that. Jesus is accursed. Now, instantly, we know that the Corinthians were carrying out this practice as bizarre as that sounds. And I'm going to use that word a lot because, to me, that is the best descriptive word of what goes on in this church. Why in the world would they ever say in their worship service, Jesus be cursed or Jesus is cursed? Literally, they're cursing the name of Jesus in their worship. Is it just me, or do you find that really, really strange? In their worship, they're cursing the name of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, that word accursed is the Greek word anathema, and that simply means it refers to very severe condemnation. So they are literally saying, Jesus be anathema, they're pronouncing a severe condemnation of the one who they are supposedly worshiping, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is anybody scratching their head right now? I mean, can you read that without saying, what gives, man? It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, what's the purpose? Why would you come to church and worship the Savior if you're going to curse the Savior in your worship? It's really weird and bizarre, isn't it? Well... That's exactly what they were doing, obviously, because the text. Why in the world would Paul say, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Holy Spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit is moving you to say this. No one speaking by the Holy Spirit says Jesus is accursed. You can't, if you do that, you can't say that the Holy Spirit is moving you to do so. In other words, you can't say, man, I was in the Spirit when I said, Jesus be cursed, or Jesus be anathema. That's ridiculous, but that is what was going on here. Now, Paul literally hits him over the head with this truth. You just can't do that. The Holy Spirit will never, ever move anyone to say or do anything like that, whether it's in a worship service or not. That is not what the Holy Spirit is going to do. Now, it's odd. You got your hand up, Kevin? Well, that is a form of blasphemy. Anyone who says Jesus Christ be anathema or pronounces severe condemnation on their Savior, yeah, that's blasphemous. But I, I find it even more strange that this would happen 
to the church that the Apostle Paul planted. It's just, to me, it's, it's striking that this could happen in any church as a form of worship, but yet it's one that the Apostle Paul planted. And really, there's only one explanation that really seems to explain how such an unthinkable thing would happen in a church. Only one explanation. And uh, we have actually talked about this before in some of our other studies because there was a form of philosophy in those days. And actually, uh, in Corinth is where it kind of got started. There's a form of philosophy in those days called Gnosticism. How many remember us talking about Gnosticism and some of the other letters that we study. And what Gnosticism taught is that anything physical, anything of the flesh, anything physical, anything natural was evil. The body was evil. But anything that was supernatural or spiritual was good. So Gnosticism taught a, a difference or a dif differentiated between the body and the spirit. The spirit was good, but the body was wicked. So what they taught in Gnosticism, because what happened, again, the outside culture influenced the church because they were so used to paganism anyway. They all grew up in it. They were all surrounded by it. They were saved out of it. Remember, Paul tells them, look, you were led astray to idol worship, but you were saved from that. But being saved from something doesn't alleviate the fact that it becomes normal to us. How many of y'all in here that are saved still have a tendency to look at some sins as normal? By the way, that's one of the greatest tricks of the devil, isn't it? To get us to look and to normalize wickedness. I mean, let's be honest, guys. You watch enough television. You watch enough commercials. Teen pregnancy is normal. Homosexuality is normal. Lesbianism is normal. And it's all propaganda of the devil. And so these Corinthians were saved out of this pagan culture, but a lot of that stuff had to be normal to them. Well, let's be honest. Anything that becomes normal to us, what, what does it do to us? Hmm? desensitizes. How many of you guys, let's, how many of you guys remember when you first got married or you was dating you, your girlfriend and she became your wife, or if it was just your girlfriend, and, and you seen her one day and she changed the color of her hair? What's going to happen to that woman? But after you're with her a while, every other month, you don't know what to expect, right? It just becomes normal. Well, describe your wife. Well, sometimes she's blonde. Sometimes she's brunette. Sometimes she's in between. Streaked. It just becomes normal, and you, you learn to accept stuff like that, right? And that's a little ha-ha, but sin's the same way. So if you wonder, how in the world could a church allow paganism and cultural practices to enter its worship service that's why we don't ever need to normalize sin, whether ours or someone else's. So this philosophy known as Gnosticism, which was a religion of that time, it, it taught everything physical and natural was evil and everything supernatural and spiritual was good. When the philosophy of that time, Gnosticism, began to influence and infiltrate the church it was added to Christianity, and it taught this, that the supernatural Christ only appeared to be natural in Jesus Christ. In other words, there was a Jesus the man, and there was a Jesus, the Christ, who was spirit. And what it did, the human Jesus was taught by this Gnosticism as imperfect and evil. Only when Christ descended on Jesus at his baptism 
did the two join? Now, is that biblical or unbiblical? It's unbiblical because what descended on Jesus at his baptism? The Holy Spirit did. But it wasn't Jesus the Spirit. It wasn't Jesus the Christ that ascended. It was the Holy Spirit. But they taught that it was Jesus the Christ that, that joined Jesus the man at his baptism. And they also taught that before he was crucified, Jesus the Christ, which was spirit and which was good, ascended back to heaven. Jesus the man, which was evil, was crucified on a tree. The Jews, and this is in Scripture, the Jews taught, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So that practice infiltrated the church. So in their bizarre, crazy way of worship, uh, they glorified the divine part of Christ, but they cursed the physical part of Christ. You know, anything that can be explained can be accepted. Let that sink in. Anything that can be explained and uh, uh, can really be accepted doesn't make it true, doesn't make it accurate, and that definitely didn't apply here. But Paul hits them over the head with the truth by saying, that is not coming from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never make you say anything against Jesus Christ. Because what they were claiming were in this bizarre form of worship where they cursed the physical part, glorified the divine part, which, by the way, is indistinguishable in the person of Jesus Christ, amen or not. They, they allowed that to go on and, and even okayed it as a form of worship in their church. They justified it out of their ignorant truth. So Paul sets them straight by just simply saying, first of all, in the negative sense, no one can say Jesus is accursed by the Holy Spirit. You can say it, but don't blame it on the Holy Spirit. By the way, there's a lot of things that goes on in churches today that the Holy Spirit gets credit for, that the Holy Spirit don't have nothing to do with. Matter of fact, I'm convinced that there's another spirit apart from the Holy Spirit that drives a lot of this bizarre stuff in churches today second thing he says in verse three is no one can say jesus is lord except by the holy spirit what's the one common denominator of all born again believers holy spirit that's the common denominator that's what it takes for us to say jesus is lord by the way to say that statement to make that statement is a big deal why is it a big deal have you ever noticed when talking with people who are kind of religious and they know a little bit about the church and, and they know just enough to be dangerous, how they kind of give our Lord, our Savior, kind of give him nicknames like the man upstairs, the big guy. Hey, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't flatter the Lord not one bit when we refer to him as that. He is our Lord. That word Lord means master there's only one person who has a master and that's a slave and we are i'm a slave of the lord jesus christ i'm not a servant because a servant can quit a slave don't have a choice in the matter i'm a slave of the lord jesus christ and so when paul says this it looks kind of simple it looks kind of everyday ish i made that word up everyday ish Something we'd say just all the time, real flippantly. Hey, Jesus is Lord. You can't say that, Paul says, except by the Holy Spirit. Which means he is your Lord. You are his slave. He is your master. And you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way you can say it. Now, how could a congregation of believers ever get so far out in left field with their worship, that they're letting ridiculously bizarre stuff happen in their congregation like this. You're sitting there thinking, well, that would never happen at three trees. Start believing the wrong thing, it would. 
start bringing in the wrong influences, it would. Anything's possible, amen or not? Sure it is. But how does that happen? John 4, around verse 24, that, that area. You remember what happens in John chapter 4? Josh, you are too. You're studying John right now. Where's Michael? He's over at the kid's barn. Well, you're only on three. Okay. Well, here, I'm going to, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what happens in four. You already know, though, you just don't know what's in four. Jesus has a encounter with a certain type woman, Samaritan woman. And Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. They were half breeds, didn't get along. But Jesus said something after he, she gave him water and all that. And you're getting toward the end of the chapter around verse 24. They have this conversation about a mountain. She says, our people work on this mountain. Your people say Jerusalem is a place to worship. And he says, you know what? God is spirit. And true worship happens in spirit and in truth. That's the only way true worship can take place. What does Jesus mean by that? Spirit and truth. Well, obviously, there's only one spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit. Well, as obvious as that is, there's only one truth, and it's the truth of what? God's Word. It's the truth of God's Word, so the Holy Spirit has to be present for the believer to worship. Really? Yeah, no one can call Jesus Lord except what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lead him to do that. So what has to be present when we worship? Holy Spirit. So do we have to pray the Spirit down? Do we have to invite the Spirit in? As I was studying this, I remember the last church I pastored. Uh, I wasn't a pastor then, but we used to sing this supposed worship song. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Well, really? Really? You're, you got to invite the Holy Spirit in? You got to let him know he's welcome? Hey, isn't he living in you? Didn't you bring him in the back door with you? Then why are we singing trying to get him in here? Is that biblically sound or not? So let's all invite the Holy Spirit. Well, the only way we would do that is all of us are lost. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, you know what? There's only so much room in you. Right? Some of us got a little more room than others. That's okay. I'm growing, spiritually speaking. <laughs> you got to get some junk out so the room's got some spirit. I mean, so the spirit's got some room, so the room's got some spirit. <sighs> Moses. Moses. Oh, Lord. They're still telling Moses jokes at the men's Iron Man study. The spirit is what leads us to worship. It leads us by the truth of God's Word. Well, what does that mean, preacher? That means that the Spirit, listen to me, this is super important. The Spirit will never lead us to worship in a way that does not line up with the truth of God's Word. It is impossible for the Holy Spirit to lead a body of believers to worship in a bizarre way that does not line up with the truth of God's Word. It's impossible. He will not do it. He just won't. So the Holy Spirit is the one who directs worship. The worship is towards God, and he's directing us by the truth of God's Word. So when you see strange acts of worship, by the way, has anybody ever seen Let's just make it personal, but don't say nothing. Don't raise your hand and tell a story. Has anybody ever seen something bizarre in a church service, a worship service, that you thought, really? Where'd that come from? Matter of fact, it made you a little nervous. You're like, I mean, I've seen that stuff at ACDC concerts, but I was lost back then. I didn't know they did it here. Well, it just seems strange. Anything that, that, that you see 
And here again, I, I, I'm, I'm saying this like I want to say it. Anything you see strange or any time you see strange acts of supposed worship and those that carry out this strange act of supposed worship that say the Holy Spirit is promoting that, the Holy Spirit is driving that, the Holy Spirit is causing them to do that. The smell test is this. Does that line up with Scripture? Do you see that in God's Word? That's the smell test. Are y'all all right? Well, just because it seems strange to me, it may not be strange to them. No, if it seems strange to you, it's probably strange. And put it to the test. Does that line up with God's Word? And if it doesn't line up with God's Word, now, if they're just saying, hey, man, this ain't, this ain't of the Holy Spirit. We just like to do this at church. Well, cool. Hey, whatever you want to do. When the piano starts, we all get out our jump ropes. That ain't in the Bible, and I ain't blaming it on the Holy Spirit. We just love to jump rope in church. Hey, cool, man. I'll watch you, because I ain't into jumping rope. Way too much energy letting out on that. I'd rather be eating a pork chop. But if they say, man, the jump ropes were flying, people were doing double dutches, and the Holy Spirit was moving. Mm-mm. You ain't seen nobody jump roping in the Bible. Am I missing something? Well, you know, David, he, he had a jump rope. No, he didn't. <laughs> you are thinking right now of bizarre stuff you've seen in church and you heard someone say man isn't that guy spiritual tony does it line up with scripture we'll get there same 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 response does it line up with scripture paul's going to address all this Remember, he set the stage early on. I do not want you to be unaware about spiritual gifts. Let's continue. All those are good questions, legitimate questions, because if it seems bizarre, we go to the Scripture, and if it does not line up with Scripture, again, if they want to dance, let them dance. But when they start blaming it on the Holy Spirit, and, of course, someone's going to say, well, you know, David danced till his clothes fell off. You didn't blame it on the Holy Spirit, though. He just was ready to get a groove on. I ain't blaming that on the Holy Spirit. Just the white guy that can't dance. Happens all the time. So, <laughs> I really can dance a little. I was just a sample, Kevin. Don't put me down yet. We're in church anyway. We're not supposed to be dancing, right? That's right. That's why Baptists don't hold hands during worship. It's a form of dancing. All right. So how does, how does all this begin anyway? How, how does this stuff get into the church? Well, could be that. Could be that. When people become more infatuated with the experience of worship. How many of you know God blessed us with a great, you've already figured out, man, God's done blessed us with a great worship leader. Notice I said great work. I didn't say great singer. Why didn't I say singer? Because it is not about singing. It's about leading you. You know, truth of the matter is, a worship leader really doesn't even have to be that great of a singer because his job is to lead you. Now, if he gets up here and he sounds like froggy, it's going to be a distraction. It's not going to work. We get that. But, but what's the purpose? By the way, have you ever wondered why this church ain't like a lot of churches? A lot of churches you've been to, 
you go in and sit down, and it's kind of like a, a mortuary. Nobody saying anything. It's quiet. And then maybe they'll start with some announcements. Well, what does the Bible say? Enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving and praise. That's why we start that away. That's the, the last church I pastored. That's the way we started. Start praising the Lord because the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. So that's just being biblical. But it can turn into a show. I've seen it all the time. Somebody wants to pick a little more and a little more and a little more before you know it's a guitar concert. You just got to be balanced. You got to be careful because you'll take your eyes off Christ. When you get more infatuated with the experience than you do uh, the content of the worship. You know, there's this, this big debate about choruses and hymns, choruses and hymns. You know, and a lot of the younger folks, they don't like the hymns because you know why they don't like the hymns? Because it says the hymns sing very deep, rich, theological things. The content of that worship is so deep. You know, when you sing I love Jesus 40 times, it's not that deep. We get it. You love Jesus. You sing about why you love Jesus. It's a little deeper. So you can get infatuated with the experience and you can lose the content of the worship. Happens all the time. Smoke. You know, some churches use fog machines now. What about it, guys? You want a little fog in here? A little foggy? It would be fun. You could chunk spitballs, nobody could see you. Everyone that just laughed used to throw spitballs when they were in school. I know that. So, like the Corinthians, and by the way, that's the only reason we're talking about this. Like the Corinthians, they became infatuated with the experience. They lost the content of the worship. And they started the more showy, the more impressive type stuff the noisier stuff, the unusual stuff, and then it leads into the downright bizarre stuff, and it's labeled as super spiritual. I grew up in a church like that. I was known as one of the spiritual kids in the church. I was. And it can be promoted, and it, you can be led down the wrong road by doing that. The supposed worship after a while becomes uh, all experience, no content. Before you know it, it's accepted. After it's accepted, uh, it's promoted. Then it's expected. Man, we, we didn't have a good service until all the chairs were tumped over and the fog machine broke and, you know, there was a mosh pit. How many over in here over 50 years old knows what a mosh pit is? Elliot, I, I, I figured you did. I figured Elliot did. So then the worship, when that happens, who is the worship about? You got it, sister. It's about us. It's all emotional. It's all hyper experiential. I didn't say that right, but you kind of get it. I want to feel something, man. I want to feel something. So in verses 4 through 7, and we're just about done. In verses 4 through 7, the Apostle Paul teaches the church the source and the purpose of spiritual gifts given to the believer. The source and the purpose of spiritual gifts. This is important. Now let's pull our wagons over before we get any further. And remember this. We're 11 chapters. I say 11 because we just got into 12. We're in the 12th chapter. But in 11 chapters, we have seen... These Corinthian believers, they're living out their face strictly in the flesh. You don't see any fruits of the Spirit. They're not living by the Spirit. They're living by the flesh. We see them quarreling with each other. We see them uh, in cliques. They're busted up in factions. Uh, they're suing each other in the public courts. They're immoral. They're practicing idolatry. 
They have corrupted their marital relationships. Uh, They are abusing their Christian freedoms. uh, They've lost their self-control. They're overconfident. They're very worldly. All of these are negatives. Again, the only thing positive Paul has expressed toward this Corinthian church is that they, they are believers. So do you really think they're going to get worship right? No, they're not. Now, verse 4, Paul says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. So there's many spiritual gifts, but they all come from one source, and it's what? Holy Spirit. That's what he says in verse 4. Verse 5, there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. Lots of gifts from the Holy Spirit. The ministries of their gifts, of these gifts, or the service is a good way to put it. The service that these gifts perform is for our master who is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a variety of gifts given to his people in the church. They all come from the same source the Holy Spirit, and they're all a variety of ministries done for one Lord. Verse 6, there are a variety of effects. New American Standard uses the word effects. But the same God who works all things in all persons. That word effects, it's the Greek word where we get our English word, energy. It it literally means what is worked out in energy. So the effect that it's talking about is what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do through our spiritual gifts. All gifts are given or issued by the Holy Spirit. All gifts are served for the same Lord, the Lord Jesus, and all gifts are are energized by the same Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 7. We're going to go. But to each one, who is each one? Each Christian. To each believer, one is given. Now that, that, that doesn't limit it to one. Doesn't mean that a person can't have but one spiritual gift. You can have more than one. But each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That word manifestation just simply means made known, made clear, made evident. So that gift is made evident in that person's life for this cause, the common good. That is a key to understanding spiritual gifts, those two words. For the common good. The common good of who? Or the common good of what? The church. The body of believers. So you mean my spiritual gift isn't given to me to make me look good? Your spiritual gift or gifts is not given to you by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord Jesus Christ for your sake? No. It's for the body of Christ. So what does that mean to us? Again, back to the strange things, back to the bizarre things, or the not-so-bizarre things. Anybody that is doing anything in the body of Christ, in church, and says, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, if it's not building up the church, if it's not for the common good of the church, it's not of the Holy Spirit. Don't blame it on the Holy Spirit. You'd be better off by saying, I'm doing this, but I'm doing it on my own. Spirit ain't got nothing to do with it. Oh, I'm good with that. But when we start saying that the Spirit is working through me, I'm exercising my gift, and it brings disunity instead of unity to the body. Eh, Ain't the Holy Spirit. When it breaks peace in the body instead of brings peace to the body, eh, ain't the Holy Spirit. And we can't say it is. When it causes strife or discord in the body of Christ, not the Holy Spirit. The gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. They're energized by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of serving the Lord and for the common good 
of the body of Christ. Are y'all all right? Well, why is that important? Because that's the litmus test. I'll tell you a story just to show you how people think. Had a young lady call me last week, told me her name. I don't know her, never heard of her. And she said, I was curious, would you be, would it be possible for you to give um, marital counseling to me, me and my fiance? And I done promised myself I'm not doing any more outside weddings. I don't have time. I just, I don't. But then I'm like, oh, here's a couple that's, are wanting some counseling before they get married. That's good, man. I'm going to let, I'm going to drop the ball here if I don't help her out. But I was curious, why is she calling me? I mean, is my name up at Tractor Supply on the wall, cheap counseling or something? I don't know. Why are you calling me? <laughs> and so I said, well, look, I'm just curious. Uh, do you go to church anywhere? No, no, we don't go to church. Okay, Don't go to church, but you're calling a Christian pastor for counseling. Okay, odd. Uh are you a Christian? Do you know the Lord? Yeah, 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 we're, we're Christians. Don't go to church, but you are a Christian, but you're not going to church, but you want a Christian pastor for marital counseling. Well, I said, look, I know, you, I know you didn't call me for this, but it all goes together. I'm just curious. You're a Christian, but you're not going to church. Why aren't you going to church? Well, we just disagree so much with what churches say and do such as well we support lgbtq wxyz all that i this was this was the next word out of my mouth how did you come to that conclusion by scriptures what do you mean i mean how did you you're a christian and you disagree with the church's position on that how did you come to your position through god's word no, my heart. Come to that position by my heart. And I said, well, you know, our hearts will lead us astray all the time. And she said, well, maybe I should just get someone else. Well, no, I didn't say that. I said, well, she was very polite, said, thank you, bye. I said, thank you, goodbye. And now, why did I tell that story? Because our hearts will lead us astray. Our flesh will lead us astray. We cannot determine what is and is not permissible by our mental capacity or our knowledge. If God's word says yea, we say yea. If God's word says nay, we say nay every time. The litmus test for the spiritual gifts is the truth of God's word. Does it edify the body? I can blame anything I want to on the Holy Ghost, but if it does not line up with Scripture and if it does not work for the common good of the body of believers, you can put li lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Amen or not? It, it don't line up. It won't work. It don't jive. Y'all getting the point? I'm running out of stuff to say. Okay, good. It's got to line up with scriptures. Or it don't go. So when we see these things and the, we scratch our head and say, man, I, I don't know. It's kind of odd. Well, don't let it be odd to you. Look it up. Look it up, and if it don't line up, mark it off. Whackville. You know who lives in Whackville, don't you? Wackos live in Whackville. But love them. Who are you pointing at, Ronnie? Oh, John. John's not a wacko.
Yeah. One of the things that Scripture warns us about in the last day is the, it says the sorcery. It uses the word sorcerer. Yeah, pharmakia, which means what, Deb? Where do we get our English word, pharmacy? It's alluding to drugs. They were, they were, that was going on here too, John. It's a good point. That kind of stuff was incorporated, man. Getting to that altered state of mind. Why do you think this, this drug nowadays, remember from last Wednesday night, we talked about the Corinthians got into this uh, frenzied deal they called ecstasy. Why do you think they call this drug ecstasy? Because it takes you to an altered state. I'm sure there was a few mushrooms around. How many old hippies? Uh, nah, I don't. Never mind. Never mind. They're not going there. Not going to do it. Miss Mary, I can't believe you brought that up. I need to see you and Tommy after service. <laughs> Two of the grandest citizens of the church, John and Miss Mary, is talking about, I'm blushing. <laughs> oh, don't, no, no, Tommy, don't tell me your sins, man. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm not old enough, Tommy, to hear that. Dylan's the camera off. Cut the, cut. Our senior saints are confessing their sins from the, from the 40s. Jerry, you want to get in on this? No, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's like, time to go, preacher. Let's roll. <laughs> oh, I am getting hot now, Miss Mary. Yes. <sighs> Miss Barbara, you got anything? Can you bail me out here? You're out, right? Don't pull me in on this. <laughs> hey, ain't it fun being saved? Sure it is. Yeah. If you're not saved, you're not having no fun. Just think you are. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. Just wanted to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, there's three options for you. Sunday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 1030 a.m., and then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pen Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us. Uh, to be uh, in person, in-house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2.8 that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart the promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for anything that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior, He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or... If God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies and you've responded to that and you've put your hope and trust and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that, help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook. And I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able, and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then... Until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.